Okay, great. So welcome again, everyone, um, to our session on community justice workers. Today's structure will start with some brief intros of our panelists, then each panelist will have some time to discuss their unique perspective on the topic. And then we will have plenty of time for folks to discuss and answer questions from attendees. Uh, at that point, I'll take stack and folks can turn off or on their videos, come off mute, drop questions in the chat, um, whatever is the best way for you. Um, in a second, I'll pass it to our moderator, Lucy Rica, who is the executive director of the Deborah L. Rohde Center on the Legal Profession at Stanford Law School <laughs> um, to introduce our wonderful panel and get us started. Um, but first, in terms of the why behind today, I just briefly wanted to say that I think LAC um, was hearing from our members that folks were intrigued and curious and just generally wanted uh, a lot more information on community justice worker models. So we wanted to uh, work with the knowledgeable folks here who are both in state and from other states um, to basically help us all develop um, a more nuanced understanding of how these models function, what the benefits are, how we can at least initially envision um, their application to our state and our legal aid system here. So with that, and without further ado, Lucy, can I pass it to you to introduce everyone? And then we can move into each panelist's first thoughts. Sure, thank you, Zach. Um, welcome to all of you, and thank you to LAC for putting together um, this fantastic panel and inviting me to help moderate the discussion. Uh, and thank you particularly to Zach for his um, hard work and preparation on, on this. Uh, made it easy for me. So uh, my, as Zach said, I'm Lucy Rica. I'm the executive director of the Rohde Center on the Legal Profession at Stanford Law School. Uh, we're an academic center at the law school that takes a multidisciplinary approach to teaching and research and policy work um, focused on making civil justice more equitable, accessible, and transparent, um, and to promote the legal profession's commitment to the public interest. Um, so in that work, I'm lucky to get to do a lot of um, research and scholarship in this area. Um, we're gathered here today to talk about community justice workers. What does that term mean? Who are the people involved? What are they doing? Where is this happening? And what could this mean for California? Um, I'm gonna take a brief minute here to do a little table setting. We thought that would be helpful. Um, so that everyone is somewhat on the same page, and then we can move into the details of um, some of the models that are um, emerging around the country and um, even here in California, and we can get into discussion. Um, hopefully you all, um, I think the the we wrote a, a brief um, with my center that may have been, I think was circulated to all of you. So um, hopefully that was somewhat helpful, and I, I do need to shout out my wonderful student, Molly Shapiro, who worked on that. Um, but I'm going to just talk a little bit to, about some of the insights that were distilled into writing in that brief. Um, so community justice workers, um, it's a, a term that is applies to a diversity of models, um, which we'll talk about today. But, but really generally, it's um, lay helpers who are in the community and who have been educated and trained to help identify legal issues and respond to help people move toward resolution of those legal issues. So there's a, and we'll talk about this, there are many informal models of this across the country, including in California, um, and that many of you may be familiar with um, in your own work. Um, but recently, more formal models have begun to emerge um, in places that include Alaska, Delaware, South Carolina, Utah, and Arizona, among others. Um, and there, as I said, there's a lot of diversity in this space. There are many different ways that people and organizations are thinking about this work and developing these models. Um, and we'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. Um, but across that diversity, you can start to see some key themes. And so I'm just going to run through those. Um, first of all, community justice workers are not the same thing as licensed paraprofessionals. Um, Licensed paraprofessionals is also something that is emerging across multiple states um, right now, um, including Colorado and Oregon and um, Minnesota, Utah, Arizona. Um, but those licensed paraprofessionals is sort of uh, the creation of a new license um, that is, you know, kind of 
top down with uh, education and training requirements that are set and, you know, um, a person then gets a license and is able to practice a limited area of law um, for compensation usually. Um, and um, that is related to, but different from what we're going to be talking about today. Community justice workers are generally not given an individual license to practice law. They're usually affiliated with an umbrella organization, such as a legal services organization or a community-based organization or even an educational institution, and they do not charge for their services. Um, justice workers are members of the communities in which they work and often are already performing in trusted roles in the community, such as in community health or domestic, as domestic violence advocates. Um, and they are engaging with the needs of the community already and and in um, leaning into justice work enables them to layer legal into that existing work. Um, often justice workers are staff or volunteers at community-based organizations, but not always. Sometimes they are lay employees or volunteers of legal services organizations. Um, justice workers are supervised or have access to lawyers for questions and assistance in their work. Um, again, this is an area where there's diversity in some models. Um, the program is run or managed by a legal services organization who oversees the justice workers who are embedded in the community or in community-based organizations. And Nicole will talk more about Alaska's model, which is um, follows this for now. And another uh, example is Delaware or a domestic violence advocacy program in Utah. Um, in other models, other kinds of organizations serve in this role. For example, in Utah, there's a medical debt legal advocates program that is um, kind of the supervision part of it takes place through Innovation for Justice, which is a justice innovation design organization affiliated with the University of Utah. Um, so again, there's diversity, but but generally justice workers are supervised or have access to lawyers for um, questions and assistance as they do their work. Um, as I said before, justice workers do not charge for the services they provide. Um, and usually legal services, the scope of legal services provided are very narrowly tailored um, so that training can be focused um, and developed and that folks can be trained up and deployed rapidly and expertise can be gained quickly. Now, the training can be modularized so that additional expertise can be layered on, but it's it's it tends to be very, very focused on um, the per, a particular legal issue. So for example, and Nicole will talk about this, SNAP benefits um, in Alaska, protective orders in Utah, um, and um, uh, initial response to evictions in Delaware and South Carolina. Um, what justice workers can do, like what the legal activities they're able to perform, <clears throat> depends a lot on the regulatory circumstances at play. So usually, and we're going to talk a lot about this, the ban on unauthorized practice of law will limit how much a justice worker can do to help someone reach a legal resolution. And that's, you know, the typical um, uh, UPL limits that we see in terms of limiting assistance to pro provision of legal information and referral, like triage and referral to um, legal services organizations. Um, and this this is the case in most states, and it's certainly the case in California, which has a very broad ban on the unauthorized practice of law. Alaska, as Nicole will explain, has a much more narrowly scoped ban on UPL, and so lay advocates may be able to do a lot more even within the regulatory limits. Um, but usually UPL is a real limiting factor on what justice workers can do. Um, it's also a limiting factor potentially on the ability of this model to scale um, to make a real impact on the justice gap. So I think particularly because of that last point um, is that's why we are seeing programs seeking UPL safe harbors or a waiver from UPL enforcement um, for these programs or even the, the um, initiation of First Amendment litigation. Um, and so, um, for example, Alaska, Delaware and Arizona all have effectively some sort of UPL waiver or safe harbor. Um, Utah, because of the regulatory sandbox in Utah, these programs are able to run through that structure, which is an empirically based um, uh, regulator of legal services. And so it's a lot of data kind of is flowing um, to uh, understand what these programs are doing and how consumers are being served. Um, in New York, North Carolina, and South Carolina, um, the the uh, 
organizations that were seeking to advance these programs brought First Amendment litigation, um, saying that essentially the the right of folks to um, access free legal advice from these folks and also to provide for those folks to provide it is um, protected by the First Amendment. So um, New York, I'll just really quickly, because I'm sure people are curious, New York um, uh, is on a, has been sitting on appeal at the Second Circuit um, from a grant of the plaintiff's preliminary injunction in that case. Um, North Carolina is very new, not much has happened yet. And South Carolina, which was a case brought by the NAACP focused on eviction assistance, um, the South Carolina Supreme Court approved the NAACP's proposed justice worker program. And so the federal case was re recently dismissed. So interesting sort of stuff happening in the federal courts around um, First Amendment on this, unclear how that's going to play out. Um, so hopefully what you perceive is that this is a really exciting time. There's a lot happening that could have significant impacts on the justice gap for those who are most impacted by it and could empower communities to um, help their members and expand legal services organizations reach. But there are a lot of questions um, and concerns, questions around what are the activities that folks are able to provide, uh, perform? What does the supervision look like? Um, what is the scope of activities that are that are being targeted? What are education? How does it, what does education and training look like? What is the funding situation for these models? And what does oversight and regulation look like? Um, and so we want to get into all of these questions. And please, you know, bring your questions, your excitements, your concern, your own story of your community, because we really would love to um, engage in a vigorous discussion around all of this. So I'm going to that was very quick introduction. I'm going to introduce our panelists and we can get into the nitty gritty. Um, we're gonna start with Nicole Nelson, um, who is currently the CEO of um, Frontline Justice. And prior to that, she spent 25 years at Alaska Legal Services Corporation, um, uh, which is Alaska's only civil legal aid provider. Um, next, we'll turn to Sasha Steinberger, um, who is the founder and co-executive director of Legal Inc. Um, which is, she'll explain exactly what Legal Inc. does. Um, prior to founding Legal Inc., Sasha uh, litigated worker rights and civil rights at Lewis, Feinberg, and Lee, and Raniker, and Jackson um, in Oakland and clerked for um, federal district court judge Martin J. Jenkins and worked with Bay Area nonprofits um, on workers' rights and benefits issues. Um, Prior to law school, Sasha did community labor, electoral organizing, and uses her community organizing background to employ the law as a tool to help clients move out of poverty. Um, Sasha received her JD from UC Law SF, uh, formerly UC Hastings, and her BA from McGill. Um, Sylvia Argueta is um, the executive director and has been the executive director of LAFLA, Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles since 2008. Um, LAFLA is the frontline law firm for low-income individuals in Los Angeles County and is committed to promoting access to justice, strengthening communities, fighting discrimination, and affecting systemic change through representation, advocacy, and community education. Sylvia leads 200 plus staff um, at LAFLA with five offices, including the very cool one, but on her background, um, four self-help centers and three courthouse domestic violence clinics and oversees an annual budget of over $41 million um, and recently oversaw a capital campaign of $18 million for $18 million and the construction of LAFLA's new headquarters, the building um, that I mentioned before. Um, we are, are very lucky to have these panelists and um, I thank them all for the time and commitment that they gave to preparing for this panel and for their work generally. Um, and so I will start with Nicole, who is going to give us an overview of her, of the Alaska um, community justice worker model. And I think also sort of a, um, a more national scope it, th that she has been able to participate in through her work with Frontline Justice. So Nicole. Thank you. Um, so, and, um... Let's see, Zach, are you going to share my uh, slides for me? Okay, great. So I, as Lucy said, I'm Nicole Nelson and I am currently the CEO of Frontline Justice, which is a, a new national organization that is meant to clear space for 
community justice workers to exist across the nation and also to develop resources and supports for community justice workers. Um, I came to this work in November and prior to that I've been working in um, the field in legal aid for my entire legal career um, at Alaska Legal Services. So I just give this history because um, it will help uh, those of you who don't know me understand why I'm presenting on the Alaska model. Um, so again, um, and I think how the Alaska Community Justice Worker model developed is really uh, tied into uh, my, you know, my career as a legal aid attorney and trying to solve for the problems that I know all of you try to solve for in your communities, which is trying to figure out how we serve all the folks in our communities who aren't able, you know, with the limited resources we have, and especially when we're unable to meet community demand. So, um, and I will say too that uh, I was the long-term executive director of the legal aid program in Alaska uh, for 13 years. Prior to that, I was a supervising attorney and a litigator. Um, and then I was, uh, you know, started out as a staff attorney. There's basically like no job I haven't done in, a, in the legal aid uh, scenario um, over the course of my 25 years there. So um, I'm going to just kind of go through this real quickly about what the Alaska Community Justice Worker model is and really how we came to like how it developed, which was really pretty organically. And I think I also want to just say also why um, I really believe in this model and why um, it really resonated with me um, as something that would be beneficial not only for my community, but potentially for others too, with some modifications to account for, uh, you know, things, the differences that are local. Okay, so uh, next slide, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, um, yeah, next slide, great. So one of the things that in talking about the Alaska Community Justice Worker model, it's important to understand is the context in which our model grew. And a lot of that relates to the unique demographics and geography of Alaska. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Alaska, it's enormous. It is bigger than the next three states combined. It is bigger than Texas, California, and Montana combined. Um, so we have this huge, vast uh, service area. Alaska Legal Services was the is the only um, legal aid provider uh, within the state. And in addition to having this huge, vast landscape or geographic territory, um, we have very low population density. So there are less than 750,000 people in Alaska. Um, and most of those folks are um, in the, the big city, which is Anchorage, um, where I live. So about half of the 750,000 people live in Anchorage and the rest are uh, scattered across uh, little communities that can range from either, you know, from 30 people to maybe 6,000 would be a big hub. And then we have a couple of other, uh, like Fairbanks is another kind of larger city that has um, about 30,000 people. But again, we're talking about small populations that are distributed over a vast expanse, except for the Anchorage uh, hub area. Um, another thing to know about our community is that we are proudly home to 229 tribal nations. Um, that makes us the most indigenous state in the union. Um, and, you know, um, and so in addition to uh, the, I guess, in addition to the geographic challenges that we have, um, and also small population density, we are a richly diverse community. There are over 100 different languages spoken in the Anchorage School District, which makes it one of the uh, most diverse school districts in the nation outside of those in New York. And so when we're trying to solve for access to justice challenges in Alaska, we are, you know, we have, it's kind of difficult. So, um, so we have developed, um, so that's just sort of the background, the, the geographic landscape of our state and the background that we were working and we we're trying to figure out how we are, uh, would try to meet all the community demand for legal aid, which was enormous. Okay, next slide. Yeah. So another thing to know about Alaska um, that's important for how this model developed, a number of our most of our communities, about 90 percent, are not um, road accessible. We only have one road, which is you can see where that white line is, uh, where the white lines are on this map. And that is the 
those are the only roads that exist within Alaska. The little orange dots are where all of the communities are in villages. And so 90% of the communities are not road accessible. And so you need to like fly into them um, in a small plane or uh, take a boat up river um, or, you know, snow machine. And so again, we've got, an, a, that's another uh, challenge to our work. Next slide. So about, I want to say like 2016, uh, 2016, 2017 are under the, you know, the support with support from our courts access to justice commission, our community came together to try to figure out how we would meet the unmet um, demand for services within our community. And for us, that meant as legal aid providers, I knew that no matter how hard we tried, we were turning away one person for every one that came to our doors because of a lack of resources. And we also knew that most people, like 80% of people who had an unmet legal need weren't even making it to our doors. So huge community demand, which, you know, from my legal aid colleagues, colleagues, I understand is consistent across the board. We have this huge community demand for services and an inability to meet it because of our, um, because of the uh, uh, limited resources. So our community came together um, under the, you know, the convening of the court system, the Alaska Supreme Court's Access to Justice Commission. And we decided that we would try to do some mapping of what our community, you know, the resources within our community to see if that could shed some light on how we might solve for this problem. And the first thing we did was to figure out sort of where the legal services were or like the court services existed within our state. And if you look at the um, where the blue and green dots are, um, the blue areas show where sort of all the private attorneys are, and um, and as you can tell, those are in largely like along where the road system exists. And there's a little bit more like down here on the um, towards the southeast, which is where Juneau, which is our state capital. So we've got lawyers in these areas, um, private lawyers. Um, and then in the little green dots are where there are court services or legal aid offices. So we're getting some additional distribution into more of the hub communities, but we're still missing the vast majority of um, presence um, in a lot of the smaller communities. And so those are legal deserts everywhere in much of our state. So during this time when we set out to understand, it was not really surprising to us where the, the lawyers were. We kind of all intuitively knew that they would be along the road system. Um, but we also wanted to find out what resources, what other resources existed in our state to see if we could figure out if there somebody had a bigger footprint than us. And so uh, when we did some community asset mapping and learned that the the tribally operated healthcare system had the biggest footprint and in infrastructure within our state. They had um, down to almost every village, there was a community health aid um, across the across our state. And so when once we learned about that information, um, we thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could combine our services in some way and borrow some of the infrastructure of the, the tribally operated healthcare system to help extend our reach? And so we developed a medical legal partnership um, with um, ANTHC, which is the tribally operated healthcare system. And they were ready partners for us because they really knew that the, the civil legal needs that we were addressing when unaddressed were impacting uh, their patients' health. And so they um, we developed a medical legal partnership. And that turned out to be transformative for us because not only were we able to, they were great partners and willing to share their really robust infrastructure with us, but they also really transformed our way that we were thinking about our how we were deliver these services within our community. Next slide. Um, so what we learned from our healthcare partners is they were about 40 years ahead of us in thinking about how to deliver services in a in a, a better way that they had been trying to address the same challenges we had in this vast remote state um, for a very long time and we're good at it. So they had developed um, a network of uh, healthcare healthcare service providers who were trained on very specific areas. Um, that were recruited from local communities and were providing um, health services. And this included community health aides, dental health therapists, 
and uh, behavioral health aides. And these were uh, like mid-level healthcare practitioners who worked in a team-based fashion with doctors to provide services within those communities. And this was doing like, you know, they were doing really great work um, and had built trust within the communities in which they were serving and um, were folks that, because they were from those communities, had a better understanding and had more trust within those communities. And we, this really transformed our model. And we thought, oh my gosh, why don't we have a, a justice worker analog to a community health aid? We definitely want one of those. And so we set up uh, partnering again with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, who has a workforce development unit to support its uh, stratified healthcare practitioners who are community-based and trained. And they helped us uh, develop um, training modules, the very targeted training modules to help stand up a community justice uh, worker workforce. Um, and so we have we've developed curriculum and trainings that focus on upskilling folks from the community who are already helping folk are helping other community members with their their just life problems, right? Which also have happened to be legal problems. Um, and so we were recruiting folks from the community who like they may be a community health aide, they might be a domestic violence advocate. Um, within our community, they might work for a tribal nonprofit or the tribal government. Um, and so we're recruiting and training these folks who are located in these isolated communities and providing them with uh, some legal, very specific legal training and knowledge um, so that they can provide services in a team-based fashion with um, Alaska Legal Services staff. Next slide. So the there are five practice areas that we started developing these training programs. One was in SNAP benefits, the other in wills. Um, the other is the Indian Child Welfare Act cases, um, which is something, again, probably pretty specific to our service area, although there are many tribes in California. So might, you might have a steady practice there as well. Um, also debt collection defense and domestic violence. Next slide. Um, so as of uh, the first of this year, uh, we had recruited over 400 uh, community justice workers um, who are going through the training. They've either completed the training programs or are progressing through the training programs. Um, and as part of the training programs, these are asynchronous distance learning training programs. They're very targeted. They take about maybe eight to 14 hours to complete. Part of that it involves a, a handling. There's a hands-on component to that. So they're actually handling a, a case for uh, somebody in their community as part of their, their coursework. And um, again, so we've got about 400 who are either completed or progressing through the, the program. Uh, we have another 200 plus who aren't progressing through or have stopped or not responding to that. And so that's one of the areas where we hope to focus on in the future to see if we can provide additional supports to folks so they might be able to uh, complete the programming or understand why they aren't doing that, why they aren't progressing. Okay, next slide. Um, the community justice workers in the Alaska model have a wide um, variety, diversity of affiliations. Some, again, are with tribal nonprofits. Uh, some are with other uh, social service organizations. Um, they might be part of the healthcare system or education system. Um, Alaska doesn't have a law school. And um, so um, a lot of uh, some of our community justice workers are law students who are helping moving through the, the process as well. Next slide. And some of the things that, you know, speak to how promising this model is and why I think it has the potential to scale in to scale, as Becky Sandifer says, um, which really just means that it will get us out of the cycle of you know, get us to where we can actually meet community demand instead of having to turn people away. So a couple of things that I think are really great. Um, first off, uh, our community justice workers have handled, um, and again, this was at the beginning of last year, have handled um, 
like over 300 cases um, and there are additional ones that are open. Um, at this time, they were supported by one full-time staff attorney. They are located in 42 different communities as opposed to uh, the 12 offices where ALSC has, uh, has an outpost. So now we are in 42 different communities. And whereas uh, Alaska Legal Services staff is try as hard as we can to uh, recruit and retrain Alaska Native attorneys. There simply aren't as many as we might like. And so only about 12% of, of ALSE's legal advocacy staff are Alaska Native or Indigenous, whereas 30% of our CJWs are, which is great. Um, they have had a 100% success rate um, in the cases that they have taken on. And um, some of the benefits which includes monthly benefit increases and SNAP benefits, back pays, back payment, and also achieving Medicaid um, approval for folks. One other thing I'm going to mention that isn't on this slide, but um, we just got the uh, case closure numbers from the LSC, from Alaska Legal Services, and the number of cases doubled that they were able to provide services and doubled over the course of the last year. Um, thanks to the work of the community justice workers. Okay. Next slide. So what makes this possible? A couple of things. First off, Alaska has is lucky enough to have a very limited UPL um, ban. It's very permissive. So essentially, it just prohibits people from holding themselves out to be an attorney and charging for services or showing up in court and holding yourself out to be an attorney. So this is a very permissive um, UPL statute, it, I think it basically just protects against fraud, right? Don't tell somebody you're an attorney when you're not, and then charge them for services as if you were an attorney. So that gives us a lot of uh, room to, to develop programming and to help people. I understand that California's UPL law is different than that, but this is one of the things that uh, makes um, Alaska's UPL ban, uh, or UP, oh, the Alaska model uh, work. The other thing that will help us upskill our community justice workers in the future to take on more complicated tasks and expand their subject matter areas is a waiver that we achieved. Next slide. Is a waiver that we uh, achieved with 100% support from the Board of Governors of our Bar Association and also with almost unanimous support from the Supreme Court of Alaska. One of the justices uh, of the Supreme Court thought that it should be, should not, uh, that this waiver, which I'll talk about in a minute, should apply to uh, more than just Alaska Legal Services, which is the legal services entity. And I agree, it should be more expansive than that. But at that point, um, you know, we were the only organization that was ready to move forward. And so, um, you know, we as a community decided that it was best to move forward and get the waiver for ALSC in place and that we would continue to build out uh, infrastructure for community justice workers within our state with the idea that more folks would likely be coming, uh, more entities would be able, be able to come in the future. And so essentially Alaska's bar rule really just requires us to uh, train any community justice workers on the rules of professional responsibility. We, as a legal aid organization, need to provide the supervision that is needed. Um, the community justice workers are going to practice exclusively for the legal aid organization. So, of course, they're not, that means they're not charging for their services. We need to provide informed consent to our clients. And we, um, the legal aid organization, ALSC, will put the candidates up for approval. And the scope of their practice can evolve with evidence of their competency. Okay, next slide. And that is it. Um, so that's a pretty quick overview of the Alaska program, and I'm happy to answer questions um, after we move through the, the other parts of the presentation. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks, Nicole. Um, Sasha, I think we're going to turn to you next. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Sasha Steinberger. As you heard, I'm the founder and co-ED of Legal Link, and we are a nonprofit based out of Oakland, California. Um, thank you, Zach, for sharing the slides. Um, at the outset, I just want to say how exciting it is that this conversation is happening. Um, we have been working in this area um, for quite a while, and we're so excited that there is interest and, um, and excitement around this topic. So um, 
diving in at Legal Inc. Um, we've been doing. Oh, we can go back to the. Well, we can stay there. Um, at Legal Inc., we've been doing justice work in California for almost a decade. We didn't necessarily have that title, community justice work before, called it community navigators and navigation, legal navigation. But we've been doing this kind of work um, in California within the current regulatory framework, meaning within the UPL bounds, um, for about a decade. So at Legal Inc., our goal is to remove legal barriers for people living in poverty. Um, we've um, do this by training and supporting community partners to act as community legal navigators, um, much like the CJWs in Alaska. Um, and I'll tell you more about how that works. Um, I want to give you some quick background on our organization. Um, if you're not familiar with it, our staff is mostly attorneys, um, and we've worked at many legal services organizations, mostly in the Bay Area, as well as plaintiff side law firms, the courts, and an alternative dispute resolution. Unlike other legal organizations, we don't at Legal Inc. take on clients for full representation. Our whole model and focus is around justice work, so enabling and empowering non-lawyers to support people to and through the justice system. We do, however, hold regular client-facing clinics at long-term partner sites, um, which is many has a lot of benefits, including allowing us to stay abreast of issues and cross-train new employees and legal issues across the spectrum. Um, we work really closely with more traditional legal aid organizations, triaging cases, consulting on hard issues, and understanding their case acceptance and eligibility rules so we get people to the right place at the right time. Um, we also have some joint clinics with the Justice and Diversity Center in San Francisco. So today I'm going to focus on a few things about our model. Um, first off, how we see this emerging field of justice work and where our model fits, just to give that big picture. Um, our programs at Legal Inc. and their impact, and then where we're headed. So um, where do we fit? And we can go to the next slide, Zach, thank you. Um, there are a lot of ways, lots of conflicting ways probably to visualize this emerging world. You've heard a couple of descriptions already, which are great. We are all um, uh, getting together sort of how we talk about it, but this is one way that we think about it um, is up on the screen. So um, at the baseline, we think about programs and people who provide information, education, support, wayfinding, empowerment, and importantly, a lot of non-legal solutions. Um, not all issues that have a legal bent to them need a legal solution. Um, so this might include community and court navigators, like our work at Legal Inc., um, maybe court help, self-help staff, mediators, counselors, librarians, and lots of others. It also includes tech tools, um, hot doc-like guided or supported tech tools that lawyers and non-lawyers use directly um, can be tools in that work. Um, these programs, the baseline, don't require regulatory change, um, typically. They typically provide the infrastructure knowledge and connective tissue that allows a lot of this other work to happen. And then beyond this baseline are programs that engage non-lawyers to resolve specific legal issues and legal solutions. You just heard about the Alaska model, which is an amazing one, um, you know, nested under legal aid, and there are others as well. So things that were already existing too, um, things like BIA accredited reps in the immigration space, um, social security and veterans advocates. Um, you heard about the newly authorized advocates in Utah, Delaware, Arizona. Um, so there are a lot of things, and, and just like um, Nicole just said, and, and I think Lucy as well, um, most of these new projects that are issue um, resolution specific um, are more likely to be single discrete issues um, and more likely to require either attorney supervision um, because they are the resolution of issues or regulatory change um, if done at any scale. And regulatory change can come in a lot of forms, including um, the waivers that, that Alaska and others have received. So our programs at Legal Inc. Um, started in that baseline. That's our legal first aid training program. Um, and then in the last year, we've started to build out an Alaska-like issue-specific model that will be under attorney supervision, um, just like Alaska started out before they got their waiver. And we're designing it so that it's still safe in a non-waiver state like California, but it will allow us to get into the issue-specific resolution space even while we are awaiting any changes. Um, so um, importantly, both the baseline um, and these issue-specific uh, programs are really necessary and both have the potential to bring both like legal empowerment lenses and shift the places where people um, gain legal knowledge and are able to act on it. Okay, great. Let's go to the next slide, please. So with that background, I want to tell you a little bit more about our programs at Legal Inc. Uh, we have two main ones. Uh, first is our Legal First Aid program. 
and that's where we train and support providers to identify, triage, and respond to legal issues. This training is broad. Uh, we train on the top legal issues facing low-income populations, includes civil, includes criminal, includes immigration. And once people are trained, they become part of our Navigator network. They hear regularly from us. They can access our staff for consults. They attend follow-up trainings. They can join our ambassador program to represent their organization within the network. Um, we've trained over 1,500 people in the um, Northern California. Uh, and beyond the Bay Area, we've recently expanded to additional counties in Northern California and are fundraising to expand statewide with an asynchronous, meaning online, <clears throat> that you can watch at any time, learning platform offering modules of legal first aid that providers can engage with across the state. So this work again is within that baseline, it's UPL safe. Our next program is our debt justice program. It's new, it's not launched yet. And for three years, uh, we ran what we called our fellowship program. It was year long and it was a deeper training than legal first aid. It was still broad in scope and issue. So all the issues that um, our fellows saw in their regular work. And after three years of learnings and data collection, uh, we've been working to pivot it into an issue specific program that will train community partners to resolve a discrete issue under attorney supervision. Um, again, this is UPL safe, but it could scale if we obtained a waiver for the work where um, justice workers could work more independently. So finally, we also develop resources and advocate for justice work and share our learnings through technical assistance with other jurisdictions. So we have a referral search tool online. We believe in um, tailored and helpful tech tools, so it's screening tools and FAQs for our justice workers to work with, use with our clients. We're also helping to support the growth of justice work in California and beyond. And we wanna be able to share what we've learned. So we offer a range of technical assistance to partners who are looking to set up similar navigator programs in their own communities. Uh, and that um, is offering a train the trainers model that uses a modified legal first aid curriculum and we've worked in both South Carolina and Oklahoma to stand up programs there with local organizations. And we're taking, we're talking now to a few new states um, coming up for the next year. Okay, next slide, please. I wanna quickly um, give you a visual of how our programs work. Um, so we at Legal Inc provide the training, the legal information, the tools, the support. Um, in our debt justice program, that issue specific one, we will also provide the supervision like the Alaska program does. Um, but the people we train, the navigators or justice workers, are full-time staff at poverty-fighting organizations, healthcare providers, and other nonprofits. Some of them are on the screen, some of the organizations. These folks are already working closely with people experiencing poverty. They are already seeing all the legal issues. They are already spending time trying to figure out what to do with the issues, where to refer, what does something mean, why is this or is it a barrier to what I'm trying to do with the client, and how long will it take to resolve so what we do is we equip those staff with the tools they need to identify and respond and support. And then they then add that capacity to their professional toolbox, to their organizations and to their communities. Um, many of our justice workers are former clients themselves and are deeply part of the communities that they serve. So I wanna talk a little bit about what our navigators can do, what benefit do they add, even working within that sort of baseline um, UPL safe world. So first, and maybe most critically, is that there's a real and well-earned lack of trust in the legal system. Next slide, please. So this shows two word clouds from recent trainings we've done. Uh, we asked participants to pick one word that first comes to mind when they think of the legal system. And time and again, we see the same or similar words, unfair, complicated, discriminatory, complex, confusing, everything that's on the, on the screen. Um, this happens at every training we do for a decade. Um, it's our starting place and we have to recognize it in order to make any headway. So those community partners who we work with that we just mentioned from all those organizations that were on the screen and others, um, and I should say we have um, navigators from over 50 organizations at this point, um, are they're more likely to speak the same language as their clients, come from the same communities and already be in positions of trust. So once trained as navigators or justice workers, they can help to counter and hopefully undo some of these barriers and inequities. So in concrete terms, what benefit can they add? So of course they provide information, targeted referrals and support. That's sort of baseline. Um, but I wanna give you a few examples from our recent work to show how this work can go well beyond referrals and is really legal problem solving. Next slide, please. So um, one of our navigators was working with a client 
whose neighbor attacked her and she was hurt and felt unsafe in her housing. The navigator helped the client to get to the self-help center to file for a civil harassment restraining order, supported her through multiple court hearings and helped with safety planning. The client obtained the restraining order and remained stably housed. Another navigator identified a fines and fees issue for a client whose ex-partner had stolen her car and received a number of traffic tickets. The navigator researched the issue, talked to the client through next steps, and with the navigator's help, the client obtained a copy of the police report documenting the theft and submitted it to the right agency. Ultimately, the tickets were dropped. Finally, another navigator's client had $70,000 in child support arrears, much of which accumulated while he was incarcerated. He struggled with literacy and was not able to pay or deal with the debt on his own. The navigator identified the issue, contacted multiple counties, child support offices, and supported the client to get the debt reduced to $3,500, which the client was able to put on a payment plan and pay off. As resource, resource rich as the Bay Area is in relative terms, and as many lawyers as we have in California, there was limited to no legal help in those areas that we just walked through. Even if there had been a lawyer available, these navigators in trusted relationships were the ones to identify the issues with the clients, educate them that there were options and provide them some hope to fix the problem and then help carry them forward. So how do we know if this kind of work is moving the needle? Next slide, please. At Legal Inc, we use a concept called legal capability to measure the impact of our training on navigators. Legal capability refers to the knowledge, skills, and attitudes needed to deal with effectively with the law. So in California, since 2020, our legal first aid data shows that overall, 95% of trained navigators reported an increase in legal capability um, from pre to post training. And on the knowledge questions, things like um, identifying legal issues, I know how to identify legal issues, I know how to connect clients to the right resources, I know what my role is. Um, the participants reported increases of 74 to 84% in each of those questions. With the new states we're working with, South Carolina, Oklahoma, and others soon, we're also now measuring net promoter, which is, would you recommend the training to a colleague? Goal attainment, did you meet the goal that you came in with? Um, and utilization of the training, post-training, all of which are producing really strong results. So where are we headed next? Next slide, please. And final slide. Um, as I mentioned, we're working to put our legal first aid modules online so that justice workers across California can utilize them. So all of you here at, at legal organizations, your community partners who you maybe are already working with or, or um, presenting to or, or pulling into the work, um, they'll be able to get basic training covering topics such as the access to justice crisis, their role as navigators, a framework they can use to get the right information about any legal issue, and where to find resources and referrals. That curriculum will all be available online. It's road tested, we've done it for years, um, and we hope you all use it as a tool with your partners. Uh, we're also building out, of course, this debt justice program I've mentioned. It's really exciting. We've been talking to folks across the country about how they've set up their programs from Alaska to Delaware, Utah, Arizona. Um, and we're working on developing sort of right-sized training content, as well as the tools, technology, which is gonna play a big role, the right supervision processes and data collection for the targeted interventions the justice workers will use. Um, and the curriculum, we're getting support from the program Lee Farron at One Justice as well. Um, once we have the system established, we'll be able to roll out other justice worker programs more easily, and we can support other organizations to do so as well. And finally, we're continuing to support other jurisdictions to build programs, and we're building a national network of organizations embracing community navigators and legal first aid. So there, I guess the big headline from our work is there is so much great work that can and needs to be done, um, even now, um, and we hope many of you will consider joining in. Thank you. Great. Um, we're going to turn over to Sylvia now, but I just wanted to quickly say, if you have questions as they pop into your head, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we'll also just do, you know, call on people once we get to, um, to the question section, but if it comes into your head, feel free to put it in there. So Sylvia, thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Well, this has been an incredibly robust discussion and um, I always keep thinking, what what is the, what is the additional, um, work that we do in legal services programs and how do we provide for further assistance to the clients that we serve. I'll give you an example. Um, in Los Angeles, we have, um, in Los Angeles, we have um, uh, State House LA, which is um, our, our 
big eviction program that includes 10 legal services providers and 16 community-based organizations. So everything that you heard from Nicole, I think for us has been part of what we um, would like to do and, and want to expand on the work that we've been doing. I also wanna make sure we all know that in legal services, we've been doing this for a very long time in a very, um, I think, informal way. And so that's why I think what Nicole has rolled out throughout the country has been something incredibly helpful um, because it will, I think, formalize what most of us would like um, to do with that. Um, and so I don't know what's going on, but there's some weird spotlight on my thing. So I hope you can all see me. I'm gonna share um, my screen with you um, because I have a couple of, um, just two slides, I don't have that many, um, but wanted to share this um, with you in terms of the impact that you can have when legal services and community-based organizations come together. So part of the work that we do um, as an organization is, as you all know, as all of you are doing in our in our work, is um, movement lawyering and trying to change how we look at the work that we do. And as you all know, it doesn't happen. Systems change doesn't happen with just lawyers. You need to have collective action. We need to have an assurance that the communities that we're serving are really um, building power and that they lead the struggle that is causing them to be in poverty. And therefore for us, the, the role of legal advocates is to make space for others like community justice workers um, and to bolster and protect um, the power um, of organized people so that they're not just winning cases, they're looking at, the, at, a, larger, um, at a larger set of change that they need in their communities. So stay housed, um, as I mentioned, um, is the example that I wanted to provide because we, in working with the 16 uh, community-based organizations made mostly of tenant organizers, have really been able to change how we look at um, eviction defense. And I think other, um, other jurisdictions are doing something similar to this throughout the nation. Um, and as you can see from these numbers, this is the impact that we've had by not just focusing on the cases. So as you all know, tenants are uh, very rarely represented in courts. In Los Angeles, 88% of landlords um, have a lawyer and only 3% of tenants have lawyers. So we have to do more. We have to do more educating, more work with community-based um, organizations, with those organizers who are embedded in their communities. And that's what I appreciate about what Nicole has started in Alaska and continues to do now with Frontline Justice in that uh, it's about bringing people who are part and parcel of their communities into these work. In legal services, I think, as I mentioned, we are doing that in, in various capacities and ways. Um, and one of this for us has been the impact that we've had. As you can see, alone, all of the 10 legal services providers in LA County would not have been able to do the outreach that our um, tenant organizers have done. As you can see, over 1.6 million tenants have um, been a part of outreach events, meaning that that's who we've reached. And we keep all of this data for the county, for the city of Los Angeles and other funders. Um, the educational workshops alone, as I always tell people, um, an empowered tenant is one who is educated about their rights. That applies to any client that we serve. So as you can see, Stay Housed has done um, over 1,300 workshops um, since we began this project in 2020. We've um, had over 27,000 tenants attend. Navigation, which is the part, which is part of the community work that we do, is 29,646 tenants supported in navigating. And what does that mean? That essentially means that tenants are being supported, and most of tenants that are coming to us, they just need to file that answer to protect the uh, the the eviction, so that it doesn't default. And so um, our case managers um, here at LAFLA, which we have six of them who work with tenants, we have the tenant organizers who are working with tenants. They are providing the support that a tenant needs in order to file an answer. They walk them through the process. They do the process with them. They explain how this is gonna work. A lot of the work they did do is part and parcel and with the lawyers um, setting things up so that if the case is going to, to trial, the case managers already have built a relationship with the tenant. Um, and this is something that I think um, has been a game changer for the tenants 
in Los Angeles County because they not only have lawyers and there aren't enough of us, but they have community workers, they have CBOs working with them, and they have um, in various of our organizations, uh, the 10 legal services programs, case managers, who are helping them navigate the process of an eviction. And so, as you can see, we've provided um, legal services to tenants. Um, but if you look at those numbers, as opposed to what we're doing with our education, our navigation, they're much larger in that sector because we recognize there aren't enough legal services lawyers. But if we work together, part and parcel together, we're able to achieve some very big changes. The last um, part of this slide shows rental assistance and how we've um, been able to help with rental assistance. A lot of tenants in uh, the work that we do, they have no idea how to um, uh, navigate or uh, come up with a settlement on rental assistance. Our case managers, our tenant organizers are able to assist with that because there's simply, as I keep saying, are not enough lawyers or paralegals to help. So when we work in tandem, we've been able to see really the impact that we've had um, in Los Angeles. Um, I'll give you one, if I can, one more um, slide which is where I should have started. If you see, this is how we began our work in Stay Housed. So it's about outreach, education, tenant navigation, rental assistance, and legal services. You see that legal services is not at the top. It's actually outreach because that's what it starts. And that's why the models that we've, just, we've discussed um, this morning, you see that it really is about embedding people who have worked in communities, who are part of a community, and they're trusted. Um, and I think that's been my mantra when I hear about community justice workers. And I think Nicole really set up, um, set her program up incredibly well um, because it's about having people that are trusted. As you all know, in our communities, um, we don't have um, folks who are um, educated in terms of their rights. So outreach and education are two of the biggest components that I think prevent people sometimes even from reaching us in legal services. Um, they don't know they have these rights. So part of this program that we started um, in Los Angeles was to work together. And it's a formal program, which is something we hadn't done. I think most of my colleagues here, I'll stop sharing this. Um, most of my colleagues in legal services have never, um, uh, have never had to um, work through um, working with uh, community um, uh, organizers and others in a very formal way. We have contracts now with those folks. We, they are, we're making sure that folks get paid to do the tenant organizing, to do the work in the community on education and outreach. Somehow that doesn't seem to be, um, uh, that doesn't seem to be something that, um, that we had uh, been doing for years, but had not formalized. Stay House formalized all that. Another area where I think community justice workers, and we don't call them that, we call them case managers, navigators, promotoras, um, that we've worked on has been in our medical legal partnerships. And many of um, my colleagues that I do see here on this uh, webinar have MLPs. MLPs have also been a game changer for our clients because who do they trust when they go see a doctor? It's certainly not a lawyer. They trust their doctor. They trust their nurse. They trust that medical professional. And coming together um, as we did, and um, shout out to our partners at Neighborhood Legal Services of LA County, um, who began the medical legal partnership work here in Los Angeles County for us, um, really um, was a game changer at that time when this began in um, like 2003, um, where we we partnered, as you all know, doctors with lawyers and other medical professionals to provide on-site services for clients. These were the first formal relationships that were created, and I think that we're learning. We're still in a learning mode, and I think the game changers that both Nicole and Sasha spoke about, I think are so important because that is where we need to be headed because, as you all know, maybe you know, don't know, but I have been that big proponent in legal services who doesn't like paraprofessionals because I was very afraid and concerned that they would come in and um, license folks who really prey on our communities because they're poor, because they don't, they are um, non-dominant English proficient, because they are people of color. That happens. You know that we have notarios in the uh, Latin community, Latinx community. We have brokers in the Asian American community. Um, we want to ensure that people are not preyed upon and they're not seen as folks who are going to um, 
uh, exacerbate the problems for our communities. That's why the community justice worker model is one that I'm enthused about, that I think is something we all should be thinking about in our programs. We may have varying um, definitions and what they've been in the past, but I think this is where we're headed because none of us would disagree with studies that have come out from either LSC or from the state bar and LAC on the justice gap. There aren't enough lawyers to help the people that need our services. And my last pitch is that we also, on top of all the work that we do with community justice workers, we also have to ensure that we continue to be well-funded. We are not. Um, throughout the state of California, throughout the nation, we simply are not funding legal services as it should be. And that, I think, is the dual fight we have is creating new avenues for our clients um, to have the resources to be able to get into those courthouse doors and be able to get the justice that they deserve. But as well, but in order to do that, they need the legal staff to also be funded. And so this is all, I think, um, an exciting moment for our community. And I also think it's one where we need to be very, very thoughtful. How are we gonna pay for this? How are we gonna th get the funding as we move into this model? And I think it's a necessary model. So um, I think exciting times, and I think we've all been trying different um, ways of doing this. The way that it has been codified in Alaska, I hope, is a way that we can continue um, here in California because there are too many people who live in poverty who have not had the opportunity to see a lawyer, to have a lawyer, and they're losing their housing, they're losing their children, they're losing their jobs, and they have no recourse and public benefits um, not having access to that. So I'm excited about this new turn of events and just wanted to provide you a snippet of how we've worked with um, community workers and um, organizers in the past. So thank you. Okay, fantastic. Well, that um, last point, Sylvia, the funding point is actually a great place to sort of kick into questions. Um, and so maybe I'll just kick us off with Nicole, if you could talk a little bit about um, the the funding question of you know developing a program like yours um uh what how what have you seen and what have you done with regard to raising funds for this and um what can you let us know about as people are thinking about doing this here what would that look like yeah so for us, and again, I also want to just say that I'm a longtime legal services executive director whose job is to raise funds for my organization, and I know how tough the space is, for sure. I've lived it. Um, I have to say that raising funds for this type of work has turned out to be like so much like more effortless to the extent that fundraising can be effortless um, in this space. Uh, more so than anything else that I really uh, tried to raise funds for. And a couple of reasons for that. Um, first off, um, I will say like a lot of the the work that we uh, started doing in building out the modules and the supports for our community justice workers and the community justice worker resource center that we developed came from a specific LSC funding, right? So the Legal Services Corporation has been very clear that community justice workers uh, you can use your LSC basic field grants for this funding. Um, you can also use, like we got started with some pro bono innovation fund grants to build out the modules. Um, also, uh, we, Alaska Legal Services, I should separate myself from um, ALSC at this point, but uh, the legal aid organization uh, that I used to work for um, received about uh, $4.5 million in disaster relief funding to help uh, support expanding this community justice worker model into four other communities that have large Native American populations. Um, and so that was another $4 million. Um, one other area that we found um, where funding came available much more rapidly than we thought it would or easily. Um, our community partners, when we are embedded in community partners, they are largely supporting the work of the infrastructure of the community justice workers, right? So to give one example, um, our healthcare partners, um, they helped develop the modules. They were good training partners for that for us with that and then also supported the attorneys who are overseeing the the community justice workers and paying for that so again that's a a good model um we also like to give another example one of our one of our, our training modules is targeting people who need wills um 
And that's something that's specific to make sure that uh, tribal lands are fractionated. There's not fractionalization. And so there are tribal uh, real estate uh, employees that that work for the tribe. And the tribe had an interest in making sure that we could uh, supervise that work. And so again, they entered a contract with us to help pay for the attorney who would supervise that work. Um, we also have been lucky enough to get an increase in our state appropriation, which is, um, I understand that, you know, California is underfunded like all other legal aid programs, but I think that you have a more robust funding from your state government than we do. Um, and so it's always kind of a hard sell for us in Alaska to keep this these funds going. Um, but everyone across the aisle was really on board for supporting the community justice workers from what, like just across the board. Uh, we were also able, if we ever get a federal budget in place, there was a, an earmark uh, to help support the funds. So all in all, we were, and then the National Sciences Foundation invested a um, million dollars into studying the Alaska model as well. So we about doubled the the budget of uh, Alaska Legal Services. So our total budget in a given year is about $7 million. I was able to raise an additional about $7 million roughly to support the development of a community justice worker resource center. And like the money came easier than money ever has. So that's all I will say. Um, I see Selena would also like to respond. Um, and I want to circle back on the evaluation piece, but go ahead, Selena. Oh, yeah, I'm here to talk about the money. Um, so I, I want to make sure everyone is aware that you can use your IOLTA and Equal Access Fund grants for this work for everything that's currently allowed under, um, uh, I'm about to close my door in a second, sorry, it's loud outside. Everything that's currently allowed under existing EPL rules, you can use your IOLTA and Equal Access Fund. It's, you know, it, when it's under the supervision of a lawyer, it's legal services, it should be qualified expenditures. Um, and I also wanted to say, I Nicole, you've done a presentation for the California Legal Services Funders Network, right? So private foundations are really interested in this model. They invited Nicole to do a presentation so we could understand what's going on in Alaska and what we can learn for California. So if there are foundations out there that, that um, you know, you're working with already and they're asking how you're meeting the needs of your community, this might be an idea to talk to them about to see if they would provide additional seed funding to, to roll it out, to create the training, um, work with legal, legal Link and other organizations that are already kind of targeting training for um, oh, there I am for um, for advocates who are not attorneys to make sure that you don't feel like you have to start from scratch. There's a lot of stuff going on already, and there's existing funding out there. Anybody else want to weigh in on funding, Sasha? Anything? I I would just say I mean I think um, if if uh, if your sole work is justice work, the funding is harder. I think if you are, um, you know, wrapping it into existing legal aid services, it, it might be a little bit broader. But either way, I think that funding there, we are educating folks about this new world and funding is beginning to open up in a way that maybe it hasn't been before. And we're also looking at sort of creative um, uh, non-legal funding options so where it isn't sort of a zero sum game, but actually looking at new funds um, that might be uh, possible to tap into that aren't traditional legal aid. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Okay, I, um, I would like to circle back to the evaluation question. I had a question um, on this in the chat, but um, could you all, each of you, each of you mentioned sort of a variety of metrics of how you're measuring the impact of your programs, but they're all slightly different. Um, so if you could um, talk a little bit about how you think about evaluating impact, um, maybe we'll start with Nicole. Um, and then maybe Nicole, you could also talk about this after we like circle back um, on whether there's an effort to kind of think about standardization of evaluation of impact. Um, because I think, you know, given the excitement and interest around this, it seems like an important point. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I will tell you what we did to, you know, as we were standing up the program. And again, the program was new. And so we didn't know it was going to work also. And so it was just one of many projects that I've tried in my life as a legal aid director. But this one ended up like 
seeming like it has the ability to scale and also serve our community well. So the the information that we had collected going forward is a, kind of the standard stuff that I imagine most of you have in your case management system. So there are outcomes. Um, so one part's one piece of that is just how many cases people are being handled and then what their outcome is. Um, so that is one measure. Um, and so when I when I say there's a hundred percent success in the in the cases that the community justice workers are taking on, uh, first I want to say a they're very um, these are very targeted training, so they're very simple legal procedures that people are being assisted with, um, and so we can track what the outcomes are. We also are tracking. Um, satisfaction from the client perspective, right? So that the clients are happy with the outcomes as well as, so for instance, in public benefits and SNAP cases, we could see how uh, we are recording how many uh, SNAP benefits have been drawn down. So that's the information we had that we used to go forward to our state bar and to our Supreme Court to ask for the waiver to increase it. And we also said, we'll keep giving you more information. Moving forward, I totally agree that there should be, you know, we're trying to figure out some different measures and be more, uh, I guess, sophisticated in how we're measuring things. And so there's a National Sciences Foundation a grant that Becky Sandifer and Matthew Burnett and Michelle Statz are working on to study the Alaska model and look to see what it's like the outcomes are across um, some other measures and develop a framework for that. And I think they're looking at things too about whether or not, um, you know, it's from a legal empowerment perspective, if that is changing the fact that you're changing people's relationship with the law, like empowering them to know and use the law, if that has radiating uh, benefits with outside the community. And that's something we don't know now. Um, other things we're looking at is how best to support and supervise community justice workers. If we want this to scale, we are going to have to make sure that we're not over credentialing uh, folks and that we're not putting in too many requirements, right? So we want to make sure that any requirements we have of the justice workers are evidence-based and the minimum needed to achieve uh, competency of the tasks that they're required to do. Otherwise, we're never going to get on top of this problem of meeting the huge unmet needs. Um, and then I will say that the other area where we um, participated in a, a study, and this was with Harvard's Access to Justice Lab. So it was a randomized control study in the SNAP benefits cases where we sent one to an attorney and one to a CJW. And um, so that has been going on for many years. We finally reached the number of like the threshold so that they can do this, you know, to produce the outcome. And that should be forthcoming um, over the course of the next year, I think. Um, but it took us some time to get there because we have such low population density. And so when you did the randomized control study, it took some time. Yeah. Um, Sasha, can you talk a little bit about outcome evaluation yeah. or impact and outcome evaluation? Absolutely. So, you know, when we talked about this, like sort of baseline programs, right, the ones that are not doing specific issue resolution, it's harder to track them. You're not tracking them like cases. Um, and so you're you're um, trying to figure out, like, if we're training this many people, what is the impact of that of their work on people who you may not have contact with? and You definitely don't have an attorney client relationship with. Um, and so um, that's why we look to legal capability. There are very, very few um measures out there, sort of standardized measures and validated surveys, and that happens to be one of them. We are open to any others that sort of the community is interested in looking at, and that just happens to be the one that's most available. And so we look at legal capability, of course, of the navigators we're training. We also, you know, log all sorts of other numbers in terms of the numbers of consults we get and the numbers from what areas of law, um, and of course, for our direct to client work. Um, in our fellows program, which ran for three years, we logged much more data like you would with a justice worker, um, sort of what were the resolutions of the cases and what were the types of cases and what were the strategies that worked there. Um, and we had great successes there. Um, there almost, you know, there was a chunk of, of, of the cases that didn't resolve during the time of the program. Um, but of the others, there was only one legal loss and everything else was resolved either with a legal win or a non-legal win. Um, and for non-legal wins, we find that particularly exciting because that's all the stuff that doesn't require someone to go to a court. It's really upstream resolutions of avoiding evictions um, and resolving things in ways that um, doesn't even need to tap into the resources of um, the legal infrastructure. Um, and so I think, um, 
standardizing some of how we think about this and also thinking about how we um, start to measure when you're working in sort of a, a leveraged model, when you're training the, the, the people really doing the work uh, and supporting them, how do we think about what that value add is? And is there another measure besides legal capability we can look at? Um, like I mentioned, we're also looking at net promoter. Would you recommend it in goal attainment and utilization? Um, but there may be other things. And we are working with um, an independent evaluator who does a lot of work in this space to sort of retool some of our surveys right now and make sure that as we're rolling out to new states, we're incorporating the best um, measures that we can in this legal first aid moment. But certainly for our debt justice program, we'll follow the lead of, of Nicole's programs and others and, and that are doing debt justice work already and making sure that we're capturing you know, all of the case outcomes and the savings and the, um, and the time spent so we can start to look to it, um, how this uh, impacts um, you know, space and capacity. Yeah, Sylvia, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, you had some great data um, for the existing stay house program. What are your thoughts like moving toward um, as we as we think about expanding community justice work um, in terms of evaluating impact? I think, um, as you know, all funders, uh, especially now, um, are more are so uh, focused on um, data evaluation, how you're doing, and I think that. That's been part of our work with Stay House, but I think expanding that to ensure what's the impact that we're having measured in different ways. And I think um, sometimes we, as a community, don't do enough of the surveying of the clients that we're serving. And I think that's the one aspect that we need to work on and improve to ensure that um, we are meeting the needs that our clients have. And I think that always starts with needs assessments. Um, and ensuring what is it that a community needs. Um, we can think and in you know our work and the day-to-day -day work we do can tell us this is what um, we believe a community needs but until you assess and do a true assessment of the community what are their needs where are you going to have the most impact and then when you start a program like this I think is reevaluating and changing course if you need to on what is most important I think those are some of the lessons we've learned with the program I spoke about today housed and with our MLPs is how are we tailoring the work that the navigators and um, case managers are doing to the client need and, and what they, where they need to 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 be um, supported. And so it's not just counting cases that you open or close. It's much more than that. It's really what is the impact you're having? How many people did you help? And as you saw from that slide, we really are trying to capture who's coming to these webinars. What surveys do we do afterwards? How are we having an impact in changing um, how people um, interact with us and how they perceive the assistance that we're giving them? And so I think that for us, it's always about um, going back to community and saying, did this work for you? Is that helping you? Um, because I can tell you initially, you know, when, when we have case managers, there's this like, are you a lawyer? And because I think our clients have been conditioned this way to say, wait, you're not a lawyer. I wanted to talk to a lawyer. I walked in into a legal aid office. I don't want to talk to someone who's not a lawyer. Um, and so I think there has to be a lot of education and, um, and then that building of the trust that it's okay, you don't need to talk to the lawyer because you have this other individual who actually is going to probably help you a great deal um, in as you navigate through this entire case. So I think um, my, my pitch is always going back to serving the community, working with community, having workshops to say, is this working for you? And that's where I think we've learned a lot at LAFLA from um, organizers. Organizers are, God, bless them. They know how to deal with community, how to work with them because they're embedded in those communities and um, they teach us um, much more. And they, they've been the ones navigating, how do we go back to community and say, is this working for you? It's not just about numbers, um, you know, and I think we learned that lesson a long time ago as, as an LSE organization. It used to just be the numbers, you know, we're the numbers um, and the stories and really, and, and give us a snippet of a story. But um, I think that is, um, that is actually the wrong way of looking at the impact you're having. And I think uh, kudos to LSE because they've now expanded um, in our reporting um, how, what impact we're having in outreach is one of the big areas that we have to report on. Um, and it actually is a bol something that also um, we haven't talked about is our staff. It really bolsters their confidence to see this is the impact you're having. It may not be cases open, cases closed, um, um, but it really is what is the impact you're having with the individual clients that you're helping. And when they see that kind of type of data, when they see those comments from clients, I think that's what 
frankly, especially in, in this tough time um, in keeping staff, it's what keeps people motivated. Great. Um, Zach, could you um, make it so we can see all the little squares? Um, I just want to, I have lots more questions prepared. But I, I, I want to throw it open to this group, um, all of you who have sat through almost 90 minutes of us talking at you, um, to see if anybody has questions that they would like to throw out. practicing my comfort with uncomfortable silence. I'm not very good at it. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, okay, Nicole, I wanted to circle back with you on um, one of the points that you made, which is that your train, which is about the training. Um, uh, you've, you've mentioned this um, and you sort of have stressed it which is that the training that you are, the education and training that you are deploying, number one, it's modularized, it's very fo focused and specific, but it's it's developed by workforce development experts. Um, so can you dig into that a little bit and talk about, number one, what is that? Like what, and how, do, how does that look different from um, how lawyers might think about the requirements for education and training? And why did you take that approach? Sure. Um... Maybe I'll start with first the the first or the second question and answer that first, why we took this approach. And I think the reason that we took this approach is we were really worried about within our communities that um that about over credentialing and the requirements, the burdens we would place on people who, again, in a lot of our communities are very remote places. Um, and any additional, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were building a system that was as inclusive as possible. And that started from the position that anybody who wants to do this work could do this work with the right training and support until proven otherwise. And it was our job to figure out what the right training and support would be. Because we wanted to make sure, again, like in this area, we think that the people who are closest to the problem are, are going to have the best solutions. And so if we have somebody, for instance, who's Yupik, who lives in a very remote village, who's off the road system and knows that community well and is trusted within that community, it would be far easier for us to infuse a little bit of legal knowledge into that person or with to that person. Um, it, you know, um, upskill them and give them a little bit of legal knowledge versus trying to take somebody who's from outside of that village and transplant them there and help them understand like the community knowledge that is really important to achieving justice. And so we started from that perspective and we also know that broadband is limited there. Um, and so any sort of training requirements we have would necessarily like winnow down this the number of people who would be able to uh, complete it. So we wanted to start from that. And we also knew from working with researchers that a lot of the way that legal trainings are done is not evidence-based about what it actually takes. And so lawyers, uh, we are trained as generalists um, and not really specific to the task at hand. And so if you're like me, um, I learned how to practice law actually when um, I got to the legal aid office and got a case and then learned how to do it and kept doing it over and over again until I, I could do it well. We aren't trying to replicate law school and trying to teach people everything. We're not trying to create many lawyers. Um, what we're really trying to do is just sort of upskill people who already have really important community knowledge and roots and just overlay just some basic uh, legal knowledge on top of that that will help solve very simple legal problems in the absence of which um, have huge consequences for folks. Like for instance, in SNAP benefits. For the lack of, you know, filing a form, people are not getting food and they are starving. And it's a very simple fix. You just need to file this form with the Division of Public Assistance. It's not, you know, a really, it's not a complicated thing to teach somebody how to do that particular thing. And so again, those are our modules. We were identifying low-hanging legal fruit, simple legal procedures like they do, um, in the healthcare industry. And so we were, um, we learned from our healthcare partners, the Alaska Tribally Operated Health Consortium. Um, we relied on their workforce development specialists to help build out these trainings and checklists 
and modules that were very specific to like, if this happens, then do that. They have standing orders or stop orders. So they know the extent of their authority. And if something gets more complicated than that, they need to go upstream and talk to, you know, a supervisor or um, uh, an attorney. And so um, it, those are the way our, our modules are taken. We um, attorneys acted as subject matter experts in developing the trainings, but they did not develop the trainings. They're all at an eighth grade reading level and were built by workforce development specialists. Um, and again, this is just because we want to be more inclusive and make sure we have we, it, we giving primacy to that community knowledge and um, just, you know, right sizing the legal knowledge on top of that. That's very helpful. And I, Randy, I see your question. I'm going to get to it in one sec. Um, Nicole, I think one of the responses that um, we've certainly heard in discussions around some of this is that a little bit of legal knowledge might be more harmful than helpful. So um, so I, I would love for you to respond to that and talk about um, you know, your vision for this program and, and why you think that that's you know, not necessarily true. Well, it hasn't, I guess the evidence, I have seen nothing to support that evidence wise. And the information where we're giving people legal knowledge in these areas are things that they have a right to know. And so, I mean, I don't think it's, I mean, these are laws that apply to them and these are their rights as citizens of our country. So, I, I mean, I guess I, I think that people have a right to know that information um, independently. And also what we're seeing is that, you know, the community justice workers who have been recruited and are working with us, you know, they really want to serve, they're there to help their community members. They are trusted resources within their community and they're trying to help their neighbors and they're very, very careful about it. I mean, they are checking in. Um, nobody, they, my experience has been, they're not trying to overstep the the bounds of their authority. They're much more likely than lawyers. And I have to say too, I've, you know, I spent 25 years, a lot of that supervising lawyers. They're very, you know, they want to fight, they want to follow the protocol. They want to do right. They want to do the job well. And so, you know, they're really sticking to that piece of it. And I think that the far greater harm is that these, for lack of just simple legal procedures being fulfilled by people who could do them. And it certainly doesn't, but knowing how to file a form does not require a, a seven year advanced degree, it simply does not. Um, and so, you know, I think the far greater harm is that people are not going to get the food benefits that they're entitled to and they'll starve. So I think this is better justice. I think it is delivered by people who I wouldn't be in it, but for the fact that I think it's better serving communities and it's helping people get the things that they need. And we are also learning from those who are closest to the problem, what people are actually facing and what they want, how they want things to be resolved. So that's what I would say to that. I see Sasha went off mute. I did, I flagged. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted to echo what Nicole said. Um, there, you know, there's sometimes um, guesses at harm. And I think another one is that people are already giving bad information. And I think, you know, one strategy to that is that is to replace that bad information with good information and to include these folks in our ecosystem. Obviously, they are already getting all of the legal questions that are out there. So how can we include them in the legal ecosystem and give them the training and the support and the access they need to give the right information? Um, and, and just in our program, having watched this now for a decade, we have not had issues with people wanting to cross the lines with EPL. People, in our experience, who are doing this work, um, and this doesn't go for all people wanting to give um, legal advice, but for people who are working with with nonprofits and with low income populations on this work, they don't want folks don't want to overstep. They don't want it. Nobody wants to give advice that they don't know. If you know the the import of someone's immigration status and their housing and their children, they actually don't want to give advice that they don't know. But it's also on us to clarify what those lines are and where help them feel empowered within the realm where they can really run and where they can be so incredibly powerful and impactful. So um, I think it's on us to figure out how best to include them, not to um, run away from that challenge. And I will just say like one more thing along those lines. I'll give an example of, um, you know, recently the DOJ's 
Office of Access to Justice came to Alaska and we did a site visit. And we went to um, a small tribe uh, in Seward, Alaska, the Katuchik tribe. And it's a very small tribal organization. They have four employees. And Dolly, who is the uh, the administrator, the tribal administrator, had all four of her employees taking our courses on SNAP benefits and wills. And this is the financial director, the court administrator, the receptionist, and their other employee. And they were also providing like housing supports to tribal members. And one of the things that we heard coming back from that, like, Dolly, they all said, which was really like just... It may have been the best thing I've ever heard in my legal career that they were probably like, you know what, now we know we have confidence that we're giving good information to the people that are coming to us already. And we know that we're doing it right. People are already, they were feeling so stressed because right now, you know, they are the center for trust for their community members and trying to resolve problems and they're doing the best that they can, but they didn't, you know, didn't feel confident in what they were doing before. And now they have this training. They felt like, they were doing, you know, giving the right answers to uh, folks who were in their community. And one of the other great parts of that, of the, she let me know, I think it was um, that there were 80 elders in the community. And now because they had taken the wills program that all 80 uh, uh, m tribal members now had wills in place, which is like amazing. In a, a small town, so. Great. Um, I want to make sure I get to Randy's question um, because it's a very good one. So the first part of the question was, do any of you hire licensed clinical social workers? And the second part of the question, which I think can be specific to social workers, but also more expansive, um, is how do you supervise them and how do you handle the malpractice costs? Um, do you want to start, Nicole, and then we can go around? Okay. Yeah, so we don't have, so our model is not necessarily to, the the CJWs are usually embedded in other organizations, so they're employees of other community-based organizations. So some of them are licensed clinical social workers. So some of our CJWs are, but again, they're not employed by us. Um, and do, so we do supervise them in uh, their legal work when they take on a case for us, but not in their social work piece of that, right? That's not our job. That's a different profession. And there's another organization that takes care of that piece of it. We're just supervising the legal work that they're doing. And the malpractice costs are covered by our insurance or Alaska Legal Services Insurance uh, program, which is through um, NLADA's program. So they're volunteers for us, um, but they're employed by, in large part, by other organizations. Sasha? Um, yeah, similarly, um, we would love to have an LCSW on staff, but we don't um, currently. I know lots of legal aids that do, but um, but certainly a lot of the navigators that we work with, um, some have social work degrees, some are LCSWs, some are, um, are not, some uh, are just getting their GED. And in fact, um, you know, that is the range that we think is so valuable in this. Um, and is is so amazing connecting with the communities. So similarly, the organizations um, supervise um, our navigators for all of their work. We just um, support on the legal components. Um, and because our, our debt justice program is not up yet, we are not legally supervising them on, on their cases. All the work they're doing currently is, um, is in that baseline safe where they can do it without supervision. Sorry, Sylvia? I'm so sorry. I'm having, I'm having connection problems, as you might be able to see. So if you could repeat, I'm so sorry. So the question was um, uh, the involvement of licensed clinical social Oh, services. yes, we used to. Yes, yes, yes. So we used to, um, I saw Randy's question. Um, we used to do that, and um, we're running up against a lot of roadblocks um, in terms of their mandated reporting um, duties versus the lawyer duties. And so um, we phased them out. Uh, we had at 1.8 um, uh, MSWs with an LCSW um, um, supervisor. Um, and we phased that out as the social workers um, were really feeling that their position was being compromised um, in that sometimes they were getting information um, and they couldn't, they, they, they were like, 
as licensees, we have to report you're saying you can't because you have an attorney client privilege. Um, we've tried to work through that um, quite a bit. And um, actually, Toby Rothschild, who was our general counsel at the time and now helps a lot of the legal aid programs, I think he's helped navigate through that. I think, Selena, maybe you've had some, the uh, LAC has had some um, memos with to that effect. We are um, starting to revisit that program as we expand our case management program, but it uh, that's that was our experience, but I think it worked extremely well when we had it um, for the client, and then we ran into those types of issues. So it's just a, a small ca caveat, but I think they do and can make a huge difference. Okay, great. Um, we have another question. Um, in the chat, which is um, specifically circling back to the issue of notarios and brokers, um, which is how do you go about educating people? And I'm, I'm assuming here you mean um, uh, community justice workers to distinguish between, or maybe you mean uh, clients, um, who to distinguish between those who are genuinely assisting versus those who are taking advantage. Sasha, maybe we'll start with you for this one. And then Sylvia, we'll go to you. You know, I think that the setting is really different in Los Angeles. I have heard that there's um, that the notario situation is much more intense down there. Um, our experience talking to folks, um, many, many thousands of consults, um, clients and navigators over 10 years is that um, it is attorneys that are more the problem that we see than, um, than uh, non-attorneys trying to be attorneys. Um, attorneys who you know, people don't understand what the services are, are not getting back to people, you know, uh, typically um, private attorneys, sometimes in immigration, sometimes in other areas, clients not understanding what the, how the retainer works, overpaying, not getting money back, not getting calls back. Um, that is more the issue that we hear of, just to be really frank. I'm sure that it is an issue in other areas. Um, it is not one that, that we hear much about and immigration is our top um, uh, consult issue. Sylvia? Sure. So for us, um, it, it is a problem because because of the issue. Um, I don't know if people know, but notarios in most of Latin America are indeed lawyers. So a lot of the communities do believe that they're dealing with the lawyer when they're going to a notary public um, here. And so um, we've had a lot of um, education, especially in public benefits, um, which is where pu um, uh, it's immigration and public benefits. In public benefits, Notarios claim to know how to process people's applications, something a, a caseworker or case manager would do, um, and um, they prey upon people. So we've had um, at LAFLA in, um, when was it, in 2003, we created um, a, a, a clinic at an office um, because the state administrative um, judges um, kept seeing these folks in their lobbies, both notarios and brokers, um, basically reaching agreements with county workers that were detrimental to the clients. So LAFLA um, decided, no, we can't let this happen. Can we have a, a table out there in the lobby and help people and educate them that these people are really not helping you? Because when we were waiting for our hearings, we'd see this happening. And the state court judges were really, the, the state court administrative judges were just like, thank you, because they could tell when someone was um, coming back to them and saying, I had this agreement, um, my lawyer helped them thinking my notario or the broker helped me and they they said they, they knew the system. And so it's become a big issue. And even now, um, I think tenant organizers um, in the work that we do have been critical in educating the community as to who they should come to. Because as you can imagine, as the eviction crisis just in, exploded during the pandemic, um, a lot of these folks were taking advantage of our communities. And so our, our relationship with CBOs was critical in educating folks because in, especially the Latinx community, you know, notarios are, are, are just held as they can help me. And they're so, they, they charge so very little that um, to them, it's either they, they can't get help from legal services because we're saturated. They can't afford a lawyer who's charging them a thousand, 2000 retainer. Um, so they go to these notarios as a default. And I think in the Asian American community, they tend to do that. So it's about working with our CBO partners to <clears throat> help us with the education. We do educational workshops too on that um, and, and helping people navigate and understand what damage um, a notario or a broker can do th to them, especially in the immigration context where people could be deported. Um, and um, and so it, it's to us, it, it has been a big thing, but it's, again, 
the partnering with the CBOs and with their organizers or with their case managers to educate our communities. <clears throat> Helpful. Um, we're coming up on the end of our time here, but I thought it would be helpful both from Sasha and Nicole because you're doing work outside of California and outside of Alaska to describe a little bit about other programs that you're seeing um, across the country. Um, and I mean, you could pick a couple that are interesting. Um, we were both at a conference at ASU a couple weeks ago that highlighted some very interesting programs. So I thought it might be interesting for this group to hear a little bit about that. Um, Nicole, maybe you could start. Yeah, so there were so many um, different uh, variations on theme, I think, that happened at uh, the conference in Arizona that were really, really heartening, I think. Um, and again, there's just a wide variation. One of the models, um, again, um, was um, jail house lawyers. So formerly incarcerated jail house lawyers who are then um, helping people resolve their uh, unmet legal needs once they are, you know, are coming out of jail or helping people, which I thought that was really interesting and a good model too, because again, that's another underserved area. I think we all know um, for those of us who work in LSC, programs that are restricted. There's a huge gap in, you know, helping people who are currently incarcerated with their civil legal needs um, because of the LSE restrictions. So that's one area. Um, the, another, there was a, a youth justice uh, program called Defying Legal Gravity, which I thought was like really interesting too, and had um, a, where they were working with um, folks who are, you know, youth who um, had, were justice impacted in various ways and trying to um, build up their just sort of legal knowledge, um, which I thought was really fantastic. It was a really great program too. And I'm also aware of a couple of programs, you know, in Utah and Arizona are some of the longstanding programs where they're working with um, domestic violence advocates who are shelter-based in upskilling them, which again, you know, those of us who work in that have done domestic violence protective order work for a very long time know how, uh, what great skills domestic violence advocates largely have and, and sort of, you know, they're sitting in court oftentimes with uh, domestic violence survivors and often have the best intel on what is likely to happen in 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 an individual courtroom on any given day. So I think those are a couple of different models. Um, Sasha, I bet you know of others. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, it depends how broadly you think about this umbrella and there's so much out there happening and a lot of which have been happening for a while. Um, and what, what this sort of movement does is help give some um, some framework to it and some umbrella, which is really, I think, helpful. But things like in California, we have so many housing and consumer counselors that are already doing kind of quasi-legal, basically justice work type work. They're not resolving things legally, but they're coming very close and they're giving so much information and they are providing an invaluable service that allows um, lawyers in those areas to work at the top of their license and do the, the cases that actually require attorney intervention. And so I think those are models that are already existing. DV advocates, we have lots of models like that of folks that are already existing that um, we could um, support even further. Um, and uh, and then also, you know, just in terms of our work, we, like I mentioned, we're, we're standing up programs in Oklahoma and South Carolina. Um, some interesting learnings from that um, is Oklahoma Access to Justice Foundation is leading the charge in Oklahoma, um, and the uh, Georgetown Law is leading the charge in South Carolina um, uh, with uh, a number of local providers there. Um, but some interesting findings there, they both now have justice navigator networks set up, which is what they're called. Um, they have uh, referral tools, and they have uh, legal first aid training programs. Um, and some interesting findings are that the, the California law that we have built our programs around, you know, it's different state to state, but it's not that different. We can still bubble up and train folks. There's still a lot of commonalities. There's still, um, even when you get down into the different legal areas, the way that our law is, is structured and where resources are structured, there's so much there that is similar. And so we've really learned a lot and, and, um, and you know, hope to as lawyers, it sort of feels like it's our obligation to simplify and try to make these things more navigable, more simple, um, more understandable. And so as we learn from different jurisdictions, not only like the amazing justice work that's already happening, um, but also how the law translates and how we can teach it at a level that really um, is what people need. I think that um, it, it um, behooves the whole system to be able to do that. 
Awesome. Um, okay, we're almost at time here. I just do want to note, um, and I don't see any other questions coming through. Zach, is there anything that I missed that you are annoyed about? Okay, good. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Zach put in the chat um, a Google Form link. Um, oh, there it is again. Um, for if you're interested in continuing these conversations um, and engaging on um, this effort, uh, please feel free to reach out and complete the form. Um, and if you have any other questions or or anything like that, I think um, our contact information all should be available. Um, does anybody have any last questions? Anything we missed? I'm sure there's lots we missed, but. <laughs> Okay, hey, any final questions, anyone? Um, well, absolutely sincere um, thank you to Lucy for doing such a wonderful job moderating. And of course, to all of our panelists, thank you so, so much for taking nearly two hours of your time to come and speak with us and educate us. Um, I'm gonna stop the chat, stop, stop the recording now.